Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Martha Marvin and I teach at Williams College. I use zebrafish in my research. You weren't able to see the first 19 hours of fish development because you went to recess and you went home and then you went to bed and all this happened while you were sleeping and not in school looking down the microscope. So in this video, you can see the yolk and then you can see the embryo, which at this point is just two cells. Now, immediately these two cells are gonna divide and make four cells, and then they're gonna make eight and 16 and 32. So let's watch the video and see what happens next. Four, eight, 16, 32, 64. And it just keeps going like that in a wave. And then they get all mixed up and they start rolling down the side and cover the yolk, kind of like a stocking cap rolling down onto your head. And here you can see the eye, the spinal cord, and here are the somites, and here's the tail. In case you missed that, let's watch it again. Two, four, eight, 16, 32. Here's the wave of division. And then suddenly no more wave. Now they're just kind of sparkling and they begin to roll down and cover the embryo. Notice how one side is thicker. That's where the embryo is gonna develop. Here's the head, the spinal cord, the somites and the tail. So that's what happened while you slept. Another question people ask is how do zebrafish get their stripes? Remember we set up the question of what would, what would happen if we had a striped fish and a non-striped fish and they had babies? Did anyone predict that they would be covered in stars? Well, that's what your babies look like. So how do those stars eventually turn into stripes? This video helps sh show you that. So there are gonna be two stripes here along the body and you can see that the melanophores, those are the cells that have the pigment in them, get bigger and more star-shaped. But notice that it only happens in these two stripes. And the ones that are outside the stripe stay, stay small and round, but the ones that are in the stripe get bigger and thicker. And that's how zebrafish get their stripes. And this takes about 10 days of development. So why do I study zebrafish? Well, I study them because I'm really interested in what might go wrong in development. You know that in people, sometimes things go wrong when a baby is born and they quite often have a problem with their heart. About 1% of kids are born with some kind of a heart defect. Usually it's pretty minor, but it can be really huge and require a lot of surgery to fix it. So we wanna understand what causes these defects? So here's one zebrafish embryo, and this is a normal one. Um, now fish and humans use the same genes to build their hearts, brains, bones, and other body parts. Here's the heart beating, and you can see it's very fast, about two beats a second, maybe three. And here's the atrium and the ventricle, and you see how they don't beat in synchrony, but it's first atrium, then ventricle, and back and forth. But you can see that the blood all moves in one direction. Now this embryo has a very severe mutation in a gene called troponin T and much milder mutations in humans can cause deadly heart problems in teenagers. So if you can see the heart beating here, now again, this is a really severe version you can see that the heart is barely beating at all. And in fact, this embryo won't live out its first week um, because its heart isn't strong enough to carry the blood around. So humans aren't walking around with this kind of severe defect because unfortunately they wouldn't make it. But um, people with milder defects end up with damage to their hearts. And sometimes that can be a really scary surprise for them. So. We want to understand more about how genes and the environment interact to cause problems in development. 
Um, so these are two hearts that I imaged in my lab and, uh, and my students uh, helped out with that. And so we have a microscope that can detect fluorescent images. So these are genetically modified fish with hearts that, it, that make a green fluorescent protein originally from jellyfish. And they were genetically engineered uh, to be green when you shine blue light on them. Um, and then, so that's for the muscle of the heart. And here is the atrium and here's the ventricle. Now between the atrium and the ventricle, you can see this red stuff. This is the lining of the heart. It's like, a, like the lining of a blood vessel. Um, you can see blood vessels if you look at your wrist. So, uh, so if we start this video, you can see that there's this kind of J-shaped flap that goes across the opening between the atrium and the ventricle. And that stops the blood from, blow from flowing backward. So when the ventricle contracts, it keeps the blood from flowing backward into the atrium. Now, this fish over here was treated with a chemical that is found in the environment. It used to be in plastic bottles too. And you can see that there's a problem with the heart valve here that keeps the blood from flowing backward. The two sides are still coming together, but there isn't a flap anymore. So this means as the embryo grows bigger, it's gonna have a harder and harder time keeping the blood from flowing back into the atrium. So this is a, quite a severe defect. Oh, this red fluorescent protein, by the way, I said the green one is from jellyfish and the red one comes from coral, but it was all genetically engineered into the fish. So that's a very useful research tool for us. And then we use a special microscope that can detect that fluorescence. So with the red, you shine a green light on it and it fluoresces red. So what about these heart defects? Well, this one, is a normal healthy fish. And this is a larva with a birth defect. In this case, we dosed with two chemicals and we used a low dose for these. And each one alone didn't do anything, but together they caused heart problems. So that's another concern is in the environment, is our environment clean enough? Is the water clean enough that we're not getting doses of environmental pollutants that might cause problems? For us. So this one had these two things that added up to more than each one alone. And you can see here that there's a big problem with its heart. So here's the normal larva. And this one has this weird clear space behind the heart. That means its heart isn't pumping well enough to move the blood around the body. Can you detect anything else wrong with fish B? Have a look for a minute. You might notice that the top of its head looks a bit funny and its face is too flat. Its jaw looks okay, um, but there's, there's some other things wrong with its head. And so sometimes birth defects show up in a couple of different places in the body. So with my research, what I'm trying to do is find out what kinds of environmental chemicals may cause problems in fish and then make sure that humans don't suffer from exposure to those same chemicals. And that's why we use zebrafish in our research. They're clear so we can use the special microscope to look very closely at their bodies as they develop. And there are lots of them. So we can do experiments very effectively with many, many fish. Um, and so we can get a lot of data in a short time. So that's why we use zebrafish in our research. Also, they're small and cute, and it lets us do bioize and bring them to your school. I really hope you've enjoyed working with the Williams students this year and, um, and that you have happy memories of your zebrafish. So have a great week and, um, and remember bioize.